Welcome to Green Plum Summit. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, operationalizing AI at scale using Madlib Flow. Uh, first of all, you know, let let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sridhar Paladigu. I am a data engineer at Pivotal. Um, I mainly work in building big data analytical solutions on the client application on the client facing engagements. Um, so my background is in enterprise Java computing and big data using Hadoop and different ecosystems. So I joined Pivotal five years back, uh, work, since then working from Hawk and Greenplum and uh, Spring Cloud Data Pool and uh, building machine learning pipelines. So, um, so here's a quick agenda, what we're gonna be doing today, introductions, uh, which I already did. And we're gonna be talking about what's the overall data science process um, looks like in today's landscape, and how do we operationalize models, and what are some of the problems associated with that, and also we're gonna be introducing some new uh, product here called Madlib Flow. It's essentially uh, a way of uh, moving machine learning models uh, built in an analytical platform like Greenplum onto um, scalable deployment platforms like Pivotal Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes environment. And we also show, uh, showcase a couple of use cases uh, and scenarios where this can actually add value and uh, uh, makes operationalization aspect very, very seamless. Um, and we're gonna be sharing a couple of live uh, videos about how we're gonna achieve that. And we wrap the session with a bunch of question and answers. So with that, let's dive in. So, um, so the overall data science uh, projects are no different than any other typical ID projects. Um, it just, uh, it all starts with the definition of what the business outcomes are and what are the uh, data sets available and how, what are the different tools available that I have. So all those things will be collected and we create a process which basically, you know, nothing but, you know, creating um, a project in the sense, right? You create a project, you basically associate what are the outcomes of the project and what are the inputs to the project and where do I get this information to, to actually build this project, right? That's all basically defining the scope of the project and all that stuff. So we set up a bunch of parameters at that point, what, say, what kind of software tooling we're gonna to be using, what um, data sets available and how, in what format they're available and how I'm going to be basically hosting those data sets to find meaningful info, insights out of that. So that's when this data review process comes in. So typically in a today's big data world, um, so we basically assemble data from you know, various uh, in-house data sources. In some point, we also accumulate data from external data sources too. So all this data can be uh, harvested in a big data platform like Greenplum or any other parallel e ecosystem products, and then basically give the access to the data scientists. So then, and also help, help data scientists to create data sets so that they can actually, you know, uh, extract and e use for use that information in a way that they will um, go and build the models, right? So this next step that um, that's called feature engineering. This is where basically um, in this whole life cycle, we probably arguably spending a lot of time in building uh, features which are essential for the models and also exploring the data and finding um, resolutions about entities and create a feature, feature set, right? That's called feature engineering. Um, without going a lot of details into feature engineering, it's essentially a process of taking a raw data and transpose into a format that models understand. For instance, you might be working on an image classification or you might be working on, you know, some kind of, you know, customer segmentation, right? So in that process, you basically take a bunch of these labeled values and transpose them into vectors of zeros and ones with the weight being the current label. So those are, can be um, very, very important in making the decision, right? So and also one of the primitive steps in data engineering. So once you basically transpose the data in a format that the models can understand, and these statistical models can basically apply those permutations and combinations and give us the results back, right? So this whole process is, uh, what I explained is a very small thing, but there's a lot goes behind that. That process is essentially one of the heavy lifter, um, usually involves uh, machine learning data engineers like myself and uh, data and data scientists like my 
colleagues, Jared Rodri here. Um, so basically building um, these features are that step. And once this is put away and we have the necessary features and data sets created, the data scientists spend uh, parallelly, you know, uh, an effort to pick up the right model for the right use cases. And then basically, you know, apply, build that model and uh, test the model using the features you created, right? So this is what the model evolution process is. You basically you now go in and iterate small iterations here. You, you basically build the model and refine it, build the model and refine it finally once you're ready. So that's when you say, okay, hey, my model is ready. You just go and operationalize this model, right? So the operationalization is the basically the process where it's just like building uh, and deploying any application to, for instance, building an application to Tomcat web server, that's also operationalization, right? In machine learning terms, deploying your model onto some uh, platform where the model can run, right? For instance, you're de taking the model that's built and deployed in so-and-so Greenplum cluster, deploying into another production Greenplum cluster, right? Or maybe deploying onto some web server, <clears throat> a Python pickled model, right? So those are the operationalization steps. So what goes in that step is a pretty uh, intense operation. So some of the models that are uh, actually built um, by data scientists has to be transposed and uh, put it into that environment so that it can work. So there is a lot goes for that to actually standardizing inputs and outputs and a couple of dependencies, packaging everything together, deploying and testing it. Um, that That's quite a, a bit of an interaction between IT, the IT DevOps and as well as uh, uh, engineers and data scientists, everybody comes together and do that, finish that process. Once that process is in place and we have the model start scoring the, the actual data, and then basically, you know, users will give us a feedback about the performance of the model and accuracy of the model. We basically then take that model and then actually go for next iteration of in the development process. This cycle goes on, right? <laughs> so, so in this, uh, what I'm trying to address in this particular session is about the whole aspect of operationalization of the models and uh, what is that uh, we, we face in a day-to-day, -day, what problems we face and how we actually go and try to address those problems, right? First and foremost, um, so why uh, most of the models, um, oh, I think I skipped the slide. <laughs> So uh, the, model, um, the model operationalization is basically where the majority of the AI models fail to take uh, and actually execute and actually give results back to. It sounds funny, but it's, it's very true. The problem is there because of the compatibilities of uh, different systems putting together and deploying, I'm sorry, different libraries of compatibilities and putting them into an environment me, requires an immense amount of resources and coordination. Right, that's one of the reason why projects get delayed, uh, fail in the sense it doesn't mean that they haven't been done right or they haven't been haven't have a process to define it, but it's just the amount of time it takes. Sometimes the market might move on, and the basically the business outcomes actually changes the requirements. As the requirements change, you are taking more and more time to actually go and um, implement those. Right, so that's one of the um, thing that I'm trying to allude to. So why that? So we know that, you know, typically in a big data environment, you know, five, six years back, we had this scale problem. So not every organization is equipped with this kind of a large data platforms where you can actually harvest this whole data and build models with a, such a high accuracy. But today we solved that problem. In fact, Greenplum was doing that for a while on a DCA computing appliances where you can actually store large amounts of data and do analytics. But not every firm has um, those kind of infrastructures. And with also the most recently, the, uh, the uh, Hadoop-based systems actually gave a lot of opportunity for us to store a large sub amount of data, uh, really at cheap compared relatively. And then also, you know, the, the more and more, you know, uh, familiar scenarios we see with the cloud object stores where you store lots of data and on demand you pull and execute and whatever workflows we want to workflow, right? So the scale problem is not there anymore, but what we had is the problem about how do we handle this data and we move this data and models between different environments. What is the standard process to do that? So we, we are still not refined that step yet. So there are um, lots of you know, uh, 
uh, incompatibilities at that stage, I should say. So, <clears throat> so modal transportation is one of the uh, uh, pain point. So if you, you could build a model in PL Python or Python or maybe R and taking that exact model, extract the piece of code and then actually take that object model that you built and deploy onto some other plat similar platform. This takes uh, some kind of transformations today. Um, so that is a big problem. And also um, what other problem is like, how can I actually deploy the model and monitor the model without a having um, a lot of involvement with IT or a heavy process around it. And also once I deploy a model, how I go about and incrementally update the models, that is also a problem today. So, but in the app space, if you see Cloud Foundry, um, you don't have that problem. You know, you can actually use multiple applications, deploy multiple applications. Each application is deployed as an independent process and you can scale them. All that aspects are there, right? But in the machine learning space, it's just catching up so we're trying to, you know, bring those concepts into this, this, um, those uh, apps, scalable apps concept into machine learning for machine learning space also. So one of the other problem is data scientists have, uh, uh, there is, needs to be a lot of collaboration between data scientists and uh, ML engineers, right? The data engineers. So that's, um, there is always a dependency and that introduces, you know, uh, latency in actually operationalizing these models not to considering the IT overhead. So, um, so what, is, what is today's landscape and what's we've been seeing over um, last uh, decade? Pivotal has a very good um, uh, data, uh, data scientist team from, uh, uh, from quite a while now. They, they implement a lot of um, cutting edge solutions uh, from the team and uh, including myself, a lot of people support them to realize and implement those projects. So what uh, we have assembled is these three different uh, stream streams where we actually go and actually implement the machine learning uh, pipelines. So one is the old classic applications where you basically ingest tons of amount of data and you basically run nightly batch scoring and actually produce results, feed it to the downstream systems. Um, so this has been, uh, where, this is where Greenplum was utilized a lot and still being in utilized in this in this um, mode and very very successful in this area and the other important thing that's in a really cutting edge what we're seeing now is an event driven training and event driven inference where every data point that you're getting um, to the system is able to basically you know um, train itself and it's basically something like a real time model development model training so this is really cashing up and we're still not there yet, but it's one of the cutting edge space. But where do we really uh, live today is in the middle area where batch training and event driven uh, um, machine learning uh, use cases where you basically get a piece of a payload and you um, apply you know, a transformation and you basically you know, uh, do a prediction on that piece of uh, information you're getting. So this is one angle. They're kind of like a near real time uh, uh, use cases. It could be a credit card transaction use case, or it could be an IoT use case. Um, there, there are lots of possibilities there. This is where basically, you know, we are spending a lot of time these days from past couple of years. These are the use cases that's uh, mainly in flight. So what are the problems that we see in operationalizing? So let, if we take the gr pure green plum approach where you build these models on Madlib, Apache Madlib, right, that's the quickest and fastest way to build models because Apache Madlib provides uh, a comprehensive set of machine learning uh, algorithms built onto and you, it'll give a, a SQL interface where you can actually um, use a high level functions to build machine learning uh, models. So because your data lives in Greenplum and you have an ability to do uh, machine learning within the Greenplum itself without moving the data outside, which is really a big plus. And this is where Greenplum really shines. And we basically quickly build models, right? But the problem we always had is actually, well, what do we do? Take this model that built into Greenplum, how do we go and deploy in somewhere else? So this is where the, actually the transformation process goes on. So, but because the reason for that is, you know, it's not that we can't deploy another Greenplum environment or Postgres environment to run these Madlib models, but the problem is about um, we have all these kinds of different kind of, you know, applications leveraging this, how we actually uh, 
interfaces with all these uh, different applications. We typically end up converting these models into different languages and then basically you know, deploying onto those platforms. This is a really highly risk because the model, the original model that's got deployed is actually losing and uh, transforming into something else. It might have a chance to lose the meaning of that, right? And uh, maybe not exactly mapped. So there is a significant amount of testing needs to happen before we hand it over to the DevOps to deploy this, right? As such, I mean, as even though I'm showing it for Green Plum, this is the same case for any kind of platform today, this exists. So there are lots of um, things coming in today uh, in the market to address these problems. So what are we doing in this space? Is that what I'm gonna talk in the next couple of sessions? So <laughs> welcome to Matlibflow. So Matlibflow is a, a model deployment orchestration and a management uh, piece of uh, utility. Uh, what we do with this is take a models that built in built on a green plume platform and trained and built on a green plume platform deploy them on a containers and then basically utilize it in any other interfaces so what are we getting with that actually so <clears throat> so i will actually quickly come here and then go back so madly flow basically uh, solves this problem of moving models and deploying models so what we're trying to do in this case is uh, we're pretty similar to uh, what other container orchestration projects are doing. Um, so meaning you built a piece of code, you can run it on a different platform without a whole lot of um, effort. That means you take a piece of code or model developed and uh, stored on a green plum database and move it and run into containers, right? So in this way, what we're doing is actually taking the same piece of code no transformation on a same platform deployed. So what's the same platform here? It's Postgres. So essentially Greenplum is a, a massively parallel Postgres database uh, with a built-in machine learning capabilities and a lot of integration points in Greenplum. So Greenplum gives an ability to ingest an enormous amount of data into Greenplum and you can actually build models and train them in a vast amount of the data so that your models get better accuracy. So now, what you're trying to do is take this model built into that and then basically you know, um, deploy them on a small Postgres engine um, and then basically you know, use that Postgres engine based model in a REST interface so that you can actually you know, uh, consume that. If we go back to the previous slide. Um, so here, what, what we're achieving with this is uh, with Madly Flow, the whole process, what I explained, like take a model which is built in Greenplum, encapsulate that in a REST endpoint and deploy onto containers so that you can actually scale these containers and throttle the containers as and when their load actually expands or shrinks, right? So how, do we, how did we do this? Uh, we did this using Spring Boot and uh, Postgres engine. The Postgres engine that we're talking about is not a database. It's an optimized Postgres kernel that we use. Uh, we containerize that along with the Spring Boot. It's an ephemeral uh, Postgres engine so there's nothing is really stored. So the Spring Boot is actually uh, responsible. The Spring Boot app is responsible for actually taking an input payload, applying transformations, and actually you know, running that Postgres-based Madlib model and returning the results. The whole thing is standardized using a, a REST endpoint. <clears throat> so what's some of the, this opens the door for actually, you know, um, to deploy these machine learning models onto its uh, heavily scale and highly scalable, uh, has platform like Pivotal Cloud Foundry, where you can actually um, integrate these REST models into your streaming analytical applications, or you can actually integrate into your web apps. I mean, the options are endless in this case. So another thing is it's an it's end-to-end seamless um, workflow that we're implementing using SQL and Apache Madlib. So there is absolutely no transformation. Um, so if you have a custom uh, models that's built on a green plum, using Madlib, you don't, you're not actually, you don't need to basically transpose them into something else to, in order to integrate with the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, same case with Python or R, model, R models. <clears throat> so how we, how we gonna be deploying that using this uh, tool that uh, we're gonna be releasing pretty soon is Madlib flow. So in this case, you're just saying that, hey, I'm deploying a model and I'm tar deploying to a target platform Kubernetes here. So how does it detect? It detects your CLI, what's deployed, pretty much like a PCF, uh, CF, 
CLI, it has a Kubernetes have cube cuddle. So it detects what's deployed and how it's configured. And it just basically gets the resources and assembles um, and deploy the model. So we'll see uh, in a much more detail about how that manifestation happens. So now with that um, piece of information I gave, now we're actually trying to provide a single big data platform as well as a um, massively scalable uh, PaaS platform uh, coming together to build a machine learning uh, workflows as well as a machine learning uh, uh, smart data apps there. And the possibilities are unlimited at this point. You could, you could actually build uh, uh, smart contracts with uh, some intelligence into that and you can actually build on-demand uh, machine learning services. There's lots of possibilities now opened up with that. <clears throat> So how does it work, right? Let's, let's see, look at the typical workflow here. So we have an ML training happens, like we keep talking about that a lot. So you have a, um, you ingested a data, you basically build a model and trained it on a green plum and you basically use the Madlib flow tool to deploy. So once you deploy the model, so what happens is basically the Madlib flow reads the manifestation of what you passed and actually pulls a Docker in base Docker image, which has a, Postgres optimized Postgres kernel and a Spring Boot um, apps. And then basically, you know, uh, takes your source model and encapsulate everything and expose it as a uh, REST endpoint and deploy it onto PCF or Kubernetes. So what does it have under the covers is this. We have a, um, this is a lot of busy picture, um, but I'll explain all the, what all the pieces are. So what we have is a far, um, here we have a Madlib REST <coughs> uh, component. So the REST component is nothing but uh, Apache Madlib model, uh, which actually encapsulated with the Spring Boot app and deployed onto the container. And we have a feature engine here, which is exactly uh, pretty much similar to what Madlib REST model is, but in this case, it doesn't have a model. What it has is a feature engineering code. Uh, for instance, you might be getting a raw payload that needs to be transformed into a feature set so this is where the transformation happens in a live feed. So again, the feature engineering also on the green plum side, it can be a, a pure uh, SQL routines, right? That SQL routines can also be deployed like this so that you can take advantage of that. So the next important aspect we're gonna be talking about is this feature cache and feature cache manager. So what a feature, what is that uh, feature exist here? Caching is uh, the reason why the, the caching exists here is um, in some of the scenarios where uh, you might be actually, while applying the transformations for the raw payload, you might need to look up some specifics about uh, their particular uh, account or maybe that particular payload that you're pegging in, right? So in those cases, you need a low latency access for the features. It's, it defeats the purpose of going back to the database and reading those, right? So we basically feed those features into this, uh, via this feature cache manager. So the feature engines component can actually directly read from the cache. So we basically need to um, manifest these applications that there is a cache aspect involved here and so on. So cache attributes are available there. So which we're gonna be seeing in next slides. Um, so the cache manager is nothing but how these caches are getting be um, uh, getting loaded and how they be updated. So this, this, this particular component handles that. So again, you know, uh, we see one of the last component here, Madly Flow UI, where you basically see, um, so what are the models deployed? And uh, it's basically a front-end application for what this whole Madly Flow is doing, right? Uh, deploying and orchestration and browsing these models. So again, if you see, everything is a 12-factor based, a microservices based uh, um, principle here. Everything is a small component deployed on its own thing, and it's, you can actually independently scale them and they are detached basically. A caching does not necessarily depend on this thing. Um, a, uh, a feature engine not necessarily depend on caching. If a cache is not available, it has to, be, you, you basically can instrument some defaults and it will go and just you know, um, do the fallback architecture. So, so I'm not going a lot of details into the 12 factor app. There's a lot out there, so we don't need to go into that, but for the sake of this conversation, I just brought that. So what are the typical steps involved in uh, uh, implementing a model and deploying using Madly Flow is um, like we saw in that, the series of uh, steps involved, you basically connect to a grain plum and you basically load your data, right? 
uh, typically how the data scientists work. If I go to a project and how we are actually helping a data scientist is, you know, that's what I'm gonna be showcasing in a really small um, uh, model. Um, so we build and train a model and you test and deploy on Greenplum and you basically make sure the model is doing the right thing. Once the model is doing the right thing, you go and deploy and model flow. Um, so we're gonna be showing a small video which actually shows all these steps. All right, so <clears throat> let me go and uh, run a small video and then we can talk about what are the different steps here? So the, the model that we're talking about is basically a credit fraud model, which actually takes an incoming payload and apply, tra apply transformations and score the model is actually uh, fraud or fraudulent or a real model. So what I have here is, uh, I'm sorry, I think I was actually, yeah. So what I have here is a, uh, a small um, Kubernetes cluster and a bunch of Kafka nodes and a green plum cluster, single node cluster. So this is, uh, again, this is a Kubernetes cluster. I don't have any applications deployed as such right now. So, but we're gonna be, this is a green plum, we're gonna be deploying them. This is a green plum command center. So my setup is fairly small here. So what we're doing here is a, a Jupyter notebook I have here, so which, uh, which actually uh, does these series of steps here, it kind of stay a green plum database and it creates a sample schema and uh, fabricates some data and load that data. Then actually, you know, does feature engineering, build and train a model, test the batch scoring of the model, and then we basically go ahead and actually deploy the model. So, <clears throat> So first few steps we can actually skip. I'm just connecting to Greenplum database and create and doing some SQL work, like I said, you know, creating a schema and actually creating some data set. Um, this, this data set is basically a bunch of credit card transactions. So once the transactions are loaded, we're just loading those JSON transactions into Greenplum. And then basically this is all a bunch of JSON records loaded into Greenplum. Once they're loaded, we're actually applying some uh, transformations and creating a bunch of additional data sets that I need in this step. The reason I'm skipping these steps, these are basically very uh, specific to Greenplum. This is nothing really um, stands out here. We're just creating a bunch of accounts tables and merchants tables and loading some data. So now feature engineering is a basically, you know, what we did here was actually for every account, we are creating some features. What are the past 10 transactions where this customer was Trans, uh, transacted and what are the same thing with the merchants, right? These are basically created. And then, uh, so here, if you see these uh, features are created and then they be encapsulated in a function here, uh, credit transaction MF underscore accounts. Uh, please take a note of this. This is a function which actually creating a um, uh, feature set and storing those features in a SQL table, which we're gonna be using later in the Madly flow deployment. So again, this is all the uh, typical machine learning uh, workflow of building data sets. We haven't done anything as such. So right now we're actually creating this one heart encoding, which is actually applying, creating some labels and uh, uh, creating some uh, vectors for that. And then finally, once everything is there, I chose the model and I'm basically, you know, created a model and batch scoring that model in a green plum. So, like we talked about, Apache Madly provides a high level functions for doing uh, machine learning uh, workflow, building machine learning applications and models. So here, what we are doing is basically creating a random forest model in the previous. Uh... So here, basically, we, we actually training a model here. Uh, Madlib dot forest train is the Madlib function that we used. So we are basically, you know, creating um, a model and then actually training the model on the green plum itself. We haven't moved anything out of green plum. Everything is happening in the green plum here. So once the model is done, we can actually uh, do a batch scoring and test the model. So what I'm doing is basically you now applying that, um, um, basically you know, running the model <coughs> and actually trying to find out some uh, uh, 
results of an existing data which is already in the database. So here we actually uh, did some scoring here. So this is a typical workflow that any green plum we follow, or in fact, any, any other um, comparing technologies. Now, how do we go and deploy the models? This is what interesting is. Now everything is done on the green plum. Now it comes to the stage uh, as a data scientist, how you can actually deploy it from without moving away from your Jupyter notebook onto PCF for Kubernetes, right? How do we take this model and deploy it there? This is how it happens. So it's basically the Madlib flow is a client tool, Python based tool uh, deployed onto them. Uh, a machine learning engineer or a data scientist workstation. So we leverage that and then actually use that tool in a as a mechanism to deploy the models onto PCF or Kubernetes. So what does it take as an input is a, man a, man a JSON based a manifestation file, which takes um, three different attributes. Um, one is basically the model itself. Another is a feature engineering. Another is basically, you know, um, uh, how do we actually, you know, <clears throat> do, if, if there is a caching aspect involved, how the cache needs to be created and managed. Those three main components. Of course, we can deploy them in, independently. I'm going to be showing that. So here, what we are doing is basically specifying where is the source model lives. So so on so green plum database and so on so uh, tables are the where basically the Madlib tables or uh, model tables are here. So, and then basically the feature engineering test. When I did the batch scoring, I did actually use the query like this, madlib.forest.predict. And I passed in an, a model and I passed in a, a feature engine table and an output table. So everything um, Madlib does is standardize an input output in terms of SQL tables. So that makes uh, a lot of difference compared to the other libraries out there because you can actually standardize everything and provide a, a, a piece of code which can actually take that information without knowing a whole lot about your models. And then finally, what is operation that you are doing, right? It could be, um, an op you can combine multiple operations in this together. For this um, uh, uh, typical step, what I'm doing is, you know, I'm just basically uh, running a query after the model is performed. So what, it's, what I'm doing is I'm extracting the results from the Spring Boot app uh, using a query again. So what happens is when you basically um, manifest the model with this, the, con the Spring Boot app is act actually going to the database, downloading that models and deploy those models into that Postgres engine. And take, once the payload comes in, it runs this specific query. So it takes that pay payload and, and stores in an in a in-memory table called feature engine test. And then basically, runs this query and returns the results as uh, as, a, as a JSON output. So that's what it's doing. <clears throat> so moving ahead, um, so we have the feature engine here. So the feature engine is again, uh, the feature engine could be a simple SQL query or a function like we saw. So in this case, I'm just applying some, um, some, applying some um, uh, SQL functions here. So what we're doing here is, uh, uh, sorry, I'm playing a simple SQL transformation as a query here um, in this step. But the feature engine I'm manifesting, I'm manifesting that I'm using Redis for this and so on. So I'm using a cluster type of a standalone. It could be a Redis Centennial and you will provide an appropriate connection parameters. And if your Redis is secured, you're going to be providing the password or different mechanisms, right? In case of PCC, it's going to be a little different. Total cloud cache on a PCF, it's going to be a different kind of plugin there. Um, so <clears throat> once you take care of the Redis aspect, caching provider aspect, you're gonna be telling what is your application is actually needs to uh, do for the feature transformation, right? So here, what we're doing is basically specifying that an SQL query, how the transformations has to be done, right? What It needs a cache and these are the cache entities that it needs to use. So I'll show in the next few slides, how does this joining of cache with the SQL works? Um, how does this cache will be um, uh, bootstrapped? So moving ahead, the last thing is about how do we manage this cache? So managing this cache again, you're saying that, hey, this is my source database. This is my um, target Redis instance. And these are my source tables and these are my target key value stores. You basically manifest it. There is no limit on how many you can specify. So you can actually specify it and uh, Spring Boot app actually instantiates them and bootstraps that. And finally, you're saying that this is my workflow. 
I have a model which has a feature engine and it leverages the feature cache. Um, and then you basically, um, it's, it's all basically, the reason I'm showing it like this is as instead of a single file so that I can actually demonstrate multiple aspects of this. So once that whole thing is there finally, so we, we are gonna be deploying using a, a Madlib flow command here. So I'm deploying with the namespace credit and here I'm deploying a flow, which that means it has to go through it transformations before the model needs to be deployed. This type can be uh, a model or a feature cache or all these independently can be deployed too. And then we're saying that I'm deploying on Kubernetes and my input is uh, basically this is the input JSON actually. Now once this uh, Jupyter node workbook runs, it creates a file and that file I'm passing here. So with that, as simple as that, within your without actually involving any uh, DevOps process or anything, we're just deploying these models directly onto the platform. So here actually, you know, we are actually deploying those models onto the platform. So what it does is at the same time, go, goes and get the base container and assemble the spring uh, container using the spring, uh, and then basically um, creating a, a rest endpoint for that and deploying onto the Kubernetes platform. <laughs> so, so once this is done, uh, Deployment is in flight. So typically, you know, we're going to be seeing a bunch of uh, logs and whatnot, or maybe monitoring the super Kubernetes con uh, console. Or if, if it's case of a PCF, then you have a PCF apps manager where you can see all well, the pro progress of the uh, application's deployment. So here we actually deployed the apps, and once the apps are deployed, we basically see um, uh, we basically see uh, <coughs> the IP addresses and you know what ports are exposed. Since it's a Spring Boot app, um, so what we have is, so what we have is uh, a couple of actuator endpoints and health, uh, which shows the health of these containers. So we can actually run this and see what's deployed on the container. Uh, here we are showing, saying that we deployed a, a credit model and these are a bunch of the uh, attributes specified during the manifestation. And the same thing with the cache, uh, what we, um, how, how many keys available in my cache and what are the key caching elements implemented. So it's basically helps, you know, to see what's actually deployed. And then finally, Madlib flow is the component that we use to actually do the prediction. Now we have all these pieces are deployed. How do we go and you know, run this? So I'm actually taking a sample payload out of a database, which is nothing but a credit card transaction, raw credit card transaction, and then basically passing that um, here to do the predict operation. So the operation that we expose on the container is by default called predict, and then you can pass a JSON. And because, I mean, and then basically the Spring Boot app takes that and does validation on the model. Again, it's the SQL data structures that we provided during manifestation. Um, during the container booting up, the Spring Boot app basically gets the, gets the payload type that it needs and basically creates a validation um, met metadata so that the, every input is actually validated. So once this is done, so you basically get um, here, the, it's not a fraud transaction and the pro and it's basically, you know, clean record, that's what it's saying. So you got the output and then basically, you know, there's a few other steps how you go and undeploy this. Uh, so you basically can undeploy as a single component or you can undeploy as a flow. Uh, at this moment, um, you're pretty much used this container. You can actually, um, <clears throat> undeploy these containers. I'll speed up this. So this is basically taking a model and deploying it to the production. Um, so using a Madly flow. Now let's see a different uh, video about uh, this application. I have a credit card transaction processing model I deployed. So, but runtime, how things work. Basically what I'm trying to show here is a Kafka streaming coming as a uh, on a topic as a credit card transaction, each payload goes directly to Green Plum, and another um, route is actually routing through Madlib Flow, where it actually scores the transaction and put the transaction which is scored onto a topic, and that topic actually um, can be used sync back into Green Plum as well as you know throw it out to a dashboard where you want to see all the transactions getting scored. That's what we're going to be seeing in the next. Uh, thing. So high level, this is how the structure was. Any input payload is coming. Like I said, it's directly going to Greenplum here. 
and another route is actually going into Madly flow. So Madly flow actually taking the payload and using feature engine container app. It's basically called a step. It's like a transformer step, uh, which is basically calling this and then uh, <coughs> scoring the, I mean, sorry, applying transformations and enriching the payload essentially, right? And then actually giving it to the model and then model container scores it, puts back uh, the JSON on the, on the backing flow, where it will be again go to Kafka and then basically, you know, synced back to Greenplum using a Greenplum Kafka connector, which is a highly um, high ingestion throughput ratio. Uh, it handles basically high ingestion, um, ingestion from Kafka to Greenplum, table to topic to table and table to topic, it can do both. Um, so it's basically, we leverage that um, to sync that into Greenplum. So, um, so like I said, you know, we had these um, <clears throat> transactions. Here you see on the left side, we have a raw transaction coming in, um, which basically passed through this feature transformation, which applies um, some joins between a cache data as well as the incoming uh, payload. Basically what it takes is it takes an incoming payload, insert into a transient in-memory table, SQL table uh, on a Postgres kernel, and joins the data with the cache data, and then basically runs a SQL query. So this is the query that actually we provided in the previous slides when we did the manifestation. There is no change from the data science persona. He did uh, whatever, whatever the SQL that we used actually shipped to the feature engine. Feature engine takes care of how it actually go and joins that with the cache. And basically, you know, once on the far right here, the Madlib rest basically got the input and it finally produced the output. Here, if we see the red, um, Letters here are the actually feature transformations happened during that transform step. And then basically the blue things were actually outputs from the models. Finally, the payload comes in, it basically takes back into the system. So if you will see really, it's like any other uh, streaming application scenario, like a spring cloud data flow, you're passing um, a, a stream of data to something, you apply transformation and finally sync it, right? Same concept in Kafka streams. So. Here, what I'm demonstrating in this is everything based on, I mean, of course, it's all basically, you know, ideally deployed on a PCF and all the spring cloud data flow and all that magic. But here I'm trying to demonstrate all that thing is how you might actually take and deploy it onto PKS, Pudel Container Services, or any other open Kubernetes uh, platform, as well as integrate with other streaming platforms like Kafka Streams, right? That's what I'm using for this demo. So, so without you, let's go and run that demo and we'll uh, see that in live action. So, um, like I said, we already, you know, we already seen the Jupyter notebook, what's, what's been deployed. It's gonna start from there. Um, this video. So we're deploying the model and then we, um, here if you see um, in the past video, I don't have the full screen, full SQL query shown. Here we're actually showing the full SQL query. Um, this is the prediction. So this is the RF model is the actual machine learning model that I'm passing here. And then uh, these are the supporting model tables that uh, Random Forest creates. So we don't need to specify that. This is the main model table and I'm pro providing an input table name and then an output table name here. See here, the input table name is a uh, feature engine test. That's the input table name it creates. Basically it gets the schema from your source database and creates all these things here. Test code is the output table that random for Madlib's random forms creates. We're just telling that, hey, create this table and it actually populates the results into that table. So finally, the query will be select star from that table. This query can be anything. You can select, pick and choose whatever you want to get out of the output. And the same thing with the, and the same thing with the feature transformation here. Um, so here, if you see, um, so I'm showing the full query here, how that, um, the query that I'm using on a database is literally passing. I'm not saying anything about caching here, caching based how it joins the caching and everything is seamless to the machine learning, um, is seamless to the data scientists. So he's just gonna use the same SQL that I, he was using and he just cut and paste SQL here. Or if he has a function, if it's, it could be really like a long process, right? At that, at that point, it's a PL, a PL 
language extension function, just specify the name. We just go and get the schema and the function code and deploy it here. And we take care of how this can be actually run in terms of joining with cache and whatnot. So the next piece is just uh, straightforward. It's just basically telling you know, how the cache is going to be uh, used. So next we go and deploy this. So, so once we deployed, here's what we got. Um, we got uh, two instances of uh, uh, feature engine, two instances of a uh, REST Madly model REST and a cache loader and a overarching umbrella application Madly flow, which actually an orchestrator, a stream, it kind of like a stream orchestrator, right? It deploys all this by default. You can actually specify how many of these in your manifest, but right now we just, you know, if you don't specify anything, this is what the um, deployment model you get. So once you deployed, you get these uh, different uh, URLs uh, by using kubectl. You get all these things here. So similar thing with PCF, um, you can actually, you know, CF apps will display all that stuff. <coughs> So now we're actually, you know, I'm showing how we tested in the previous uh, demo we have actually seen after deploying, we tested these. So same workflow here. So now finally, once this is done, so we're gonna go and actually take this uh, uh, piece of this URL and actually, you know, how we actually leverage that in a front end up streaming of Kafka stream of an application. That's what the rest of the video is gonna be playing. So here's what we built is we built a streaming application with the two Kafka um, pieces, one uh, producer, one consumer, streams consumer, and then um, uh, and basically a Node.js application which actually reads that, um, what's scored, and uh, if any uh, fraudulent transaction, it store, store shows on the geogrid here uh, between Atlanta, Tennessee, and Florida. Um, so here that, we're gonna be starting that. So here I have two Kafka topics here. Um, I'm sorry, three Kafka topics. One is an incoming one, credit card transactions. The other one is a normal transaction and a suspicious transaction. Each one has four partitions on this. Pretty straightforward. <clears throat> so I don't have any messages here. It's pretty clean at this point. So, so like I said, you know, we got four partitions per uh, topic so that I can actually run multiple threads. So here on my Kubernetes side, this is what the model, the same thing that what we saw in Jupyter Notebook, we are actually seeing that here. So right now I have a default scaling setup. Um, without due, let's just go and run a Kafka consumer and a Kafka producer. I'm gonna be starting consumer first. Once the consumer is up, we're gonna be starting producer. <clears throat> so I haven't done a whole lot of multi-threading here. I just had a basic uh, four threads running in a single consumer. You could see here the live transactions coming, it's hitting the model and we basically uh, getting the score and deployed in it. So here's basically um, what we're trying to show is basically the art of possibility here. You can actually create exotic um, workflows using this and scale these models, um, machine learning models, um, just like any other Spring Boot apps or a, or a .NET app on a PCF, right? On a Pivotal Cloud Foundry or a Pivotal Container Services. Um, so in the in this thing, basically, let's see how we can actually throttle that. Right now I have, a, a, you, I'm being using only six out of, I mean, two out of six possible containers. So as and when my load increases, we will see how containers will uh, auto scale. So right now it's trying to auto scale. So now my containers size is increasing here. So, so here you see that you know, we are using at a full throttle, six containers here for feature cache transformations and four out of four for the MATLAB it's auto scaled it. So we can actually make some changes and actually go and uh, increase the speed. So 
what we can do. I'm still using one single consumer and four threads. I mean, sorry, two threads per, per consumer. So I can actually go and actually increase the instance counts to eight container instance counts, and you can actually speed up the process a little bit more. So, so here are what I did was basically increasing the number of containers, auto scaling group with eight containers maximum. Of course, in PCF, you can do much better. You can actually you know, set up auto scaling uh, and the apps auto scales automatically. Um, of course, there is a lot more advantages in PCF. The, the topic is not to talk about that. So just gonna demonstrate and what is the possible, how do we actually go and operationalize these, these machine learning models and it all of a sudden open up the doors for a lot of possibilities. And the problem that we had um, operationalizing these models um, is probably solved with this. And we are actually you know, uh, looking forward with a lot of uh, different possibilities in this, um, in this uh, next uh, couple of cycles to finish the product. Um, so this is what we did. Uh, one Kafka producer, one consumer, and uh, three different models. I mean, sorry, three different containers. So we already saw this. Um, so what is, uh, when is this gonna be available? There's a lot of enthusiasm, lots of questions even yesterday after the talk. Um, so we are planning to go to uh, live and we're in the stages of making it open source ready. Um, and we, there's a lot of discussions and uh, touch points being um, uh, touch points every day and we're actually actively working to make it ready. Um, target is late spring uh, or early summer. So what's uh, additionally, what we're gonna be add, planning to add to this is uh, actually providing uh, support for PL Python and PLR. Mostly PL Python is the first thing that we do. So that's, uh, that's basically one of the big uh, plus point for this because in a green plum, you can bring your Python code and just convert into, and uh, basically encapsulate into procedural language extension and deploy. Um, so that basically, you know, same any machine learning model can bring to Greenplum and actually, you know, operational take advantage of the Greenplum platform to, you know, score or maybe develop the model on a larger data set, right? So that same concept, you know, um, is uh, we're going to be extending into these containers too, so that you can actually do that uh, here too. And also, I mean, sorry, you can actually deploy those models here too. And also we... Uh, our machine learning team, uh, engineering side engineering had Frank McCrone and his team is working on the integration with TensorFlow and PyTorch and GPU integration. They're doing lots of exciting things on a green plum. So eventually someday, you know, we're gonna be integrating all that work into um, see how we can actually deploy those things onto those platforms. It's too early to talk about um, that scale, but right now the whole concentration on ML and AI models and uh, of course, there will be a UA component um, with much more refinements and uh, a lot of ease will be put into how easily you can actually, I mean, you can use the Jupyter Notebook, but there will be a UI component where you can actually, you know, deploy parallel models, meaning if you, like you saw the credit model, right? You know, I can actually deploy credit model too and same models running together and then basically see, you know, measure, you know, which model is actually performing better. That's an immense, uh, win for us in a machine learning space. It might not look a lot for a Spring Boot apps, but but for the machine learning um, uh, data scientists, it's a big deal because today it's not that easy to deploy parallel models and you know test the models together. It's quite challenging. That aspect will be solved. And more importantly, uh, here what we have a story is database and platform, PaaS platform and uh, for the apps are coming together and solving um, this problem of deploying these machine learning models, right? So that's that's what uh, we're trying to solve in this. Um, hopefully you guys like the session. Thank you very much. Look forward to speak to you guys in, in the next sessions.